Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life. Wow, it is very cold out here, and it's just about five minutes to uh, uh, 11. It is 22 hours and 53 minutes into the 16th day of November 2021, and we're getting started with our observation vlog. An observation does get a little dicey sometimes because you see things that others particularly don't see. And as the ideas sort of are disseminated, uh, and this is a, a rough draft verbal essay from my notes, uh, only bits and pieces will be picked up. It does take a while to go back and repeat the stuff and sort of see this again. Uh, and also to do the background research, there, that's a bit of a commitment as well. Uh, and this is why these things take months and years. And people like myself, we're here because we spent 30 plus years doing what we did, doing what we've been doing all day long, all the time. Other people who have a regular job, you don't have the time to do that. Uh, and anyways, uh, this has to do with a uh, comment uh, from LinkedIn from uh, uh, Casey, uh, I think either Wash or Watch. It's W-A-C-H. I'm sorry if I got your last name wrong. And it says we don't talk, we don't get defensive when we talk about World War Two, uh, World War One, World War Two, Rome or Greece. And this is in in relationship to um, uh, how we see racism. And the way is, the simplest way to answer that, and this sort of had it written down, but it wasn't intentionally. In that area was the the title of a title of a another vlog that uh, will be going up soon, uh, probably later on tonight or so on, you know, uh, or so on and so forth. Um, uh, is created reality and Edward Bernays. We are sitting in a world where reality is created for us. This is what we this is what we call or this is what we identify as the matrix. And the matrix is something that uh, we really don't have much control over. We only have uh, some degree of control. And it presents a bit of a problem because uh, it's difficult to see outside the matrix if you don't have enough information. Most of the information is tainted. Most of the information is skewed. And a large chunk of the information is actually hidden. So you have to go on the scavenger hunt to find out where the information is. This is what, in many cases, what the Da Vinci Code is. This is what a lot of these people will look around for these different sort of coded secret and secrets and, and messages. The Georgia Guidestones are all about this. And you're living in a pretty much, in order to get out of these things, it's very difficult to see where you would find the information. And so people look all over the place. That'll blow my nose, and I think there's another train coming. I had to go to the bathroom as well, so just as I turned the camera off, a uh, train came by. And that's a justice. There we go. It is difficult to see outside the world we are living in. And the people who do see outside the world who have had this capacity, including myself, have had the benefit of being literally tossed out or excluded from society from the beginning. So the standards that would apply to everybody else no longer apply to you because, well, you're not worth it. So, <laughs> and But that's not necessarily a bad thing. This allows you to go see things the way they really are if you can find the information. And I said one of the, one of the key pe people in this is Edward Bernays, and then you follow Edward Bernays to Anna Freud, and from Anna Freud you go back to Sigmund Freud. And you begin to realize how influential they were in the world in terms of psychology. And you could say that when I've seen from other people talk about other psychologists, most of the stuff actually emerges from Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is your key. That's where you look. 
everyone else is kind of a version of Sigmund Freud, but not necessarily original. Uh, so this is where this comes into place. And, and his whole thing was, again, this is where you need to understand how things come into the world. The world of the elite see the, see the thing, and they're heavily involved in with heavily invested in Edward Bernays. In that, a large chunk of the way they do things is based on these psychological uh, perspectives. And this is why marketing companies, this is why uh, all these different think tanks have these, these focus groups who will try out various different scenarios. And it's about these experts and how they see things. But what happens is that this is before academics have a tendency to create their own world, to create their own reality. And this is where, you know, you have a comment coming out of, uh, of, uh, the Casey uh, Wash about you know uh, how we see racism. And that's because it's created. A large chunk of the people who are down at the bottom who are running around and doing the sort of the, the anarchy stuff, they've been worked over. They're they're the pawns. They the, the ones who are out on the streets burning things down, tipping things over, doing the riots, these are the people who know the least. They're the berserkers in history. There have always been these tribes that have been that been used by uh, larger empires, and they use these tribes as warriors because they go absolutely berserk and there's no thought whatsoever. This is who the anarchists are. They're they're the berserkers, and there is a tribe, a group of warriors known as the berserkers. This is where we get the word berserk from. This is a bit of etymology where you have to look up the history of words and how and where they came from. But again, that's, that's, that's something that doesn't happen today. People don't know the origin of words or how there are, often are very different forms of diction. There, a dictionary is not there to, tell, to teach you how to spell or to help you spell. It's not there to give you a specific definition. A dictionary is a book that you can read where you can go find out how words are used. This is what diction is. And this is why it's called a dictionary. It's about how to use specific words. And there's a whole, whole variety of different types of dictionaries, including a legal dictionary, a medical dictionary. There was one called the, the Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. And this was came out came out in the uh, I think late 1700s, 1800s, uh, and it was it was it surrounded basically sailor talk or guy talk, how guys would describe various different adventures they would have out with the buddies, out with the boys, uh, in the company of more gentle folk. So in other words, it was a codification of their misbehaviors, what they call adventures. Uh, when they're in more, we'll call it a mixed company, where the the uh, raw tone wasn't acceptable, you would have to use these sort of uh, um, terms that had a significant amount of innuendo. In other words, there was a there was a subtext to what you were talking about. And of course, in most cases, as long as it was benign enough, no one really cared. <laughs> so this is, this is how things sort of work their way out. But the thing is, the whole concept of Greece and and uh, and Rome being part of the European sphere—that's a complete fiction. Europe was never part of the uh, of the Roman and, and Hellenic sphere. This was the creation of the, of, of the homo. This creation occurred with the papacy. This is why the papacy was called the Holy Roman Empire. They pretended to be connected to Rome and Greece. This is why they call it classism. And then there's neoclassism. But there's a huge problem. If you go down and look at classism and neoclassism, you're going back to Plato and stuff like that, and you talk about uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which uh, uh, was 1000 AD, you've got close to 1500 years of history missing. What happened between the in those 1500 years between 
Plato, the philosopher, the Greek philosophers, and the Holy Roman Empire, which was emerged in 1000 AD with the papacy. And ironically enough, the papacy, as it set itself up, it set up the title of the, of, of the pope as the vicar of Christ. This is why people who think they're Christian, oh, he's the vicar of Christ. Well, again, go into your dictions. Understand where the word comes from. Vicar means to take vicar means to take the place of. So the pope is the person who takes the place of Christ. In other words, you are no longer connected to Christ. You have to go through the pope to get to the Christ because the pope is the vicar of Christ. He's the person who blocks you. From going to Christ, he he occults Christ. Occult means to block, to to black, and to obstruct. But the the part that that, that people don't understand is the vicarious to take the place of is also a Greek word. There's a Greek word for it, and it's actually two words called antis. In many cases, it's pronounced the T is pronounced as a D, so you have andi. And you have this something called it's andimension. The andimension again has a number of definitions from people, but it's, it's, it's essentially a consequence of the churches being sacked on a regular, routine basis. So rather than consecrating consecrating a particular piece of ground, it was the andimension that replaced the holy table, and that was the sort of the sacrificial altar of the Christians was. Uh, the Andamitsion, and it could be taken a while. It, it, it was basically handled by the bishop. And it took the place, the Andamitsion, the Antimitsion, took the place of the Holy Table. So when you have the term, the vicar of Christ, the person who takes the place of Christ, you have an Andamit, Andi Christos, right? Andi Christos takes the place of Christ. Well, roll that forward to the modern era, and Andi or Antis becomes anti. That's how the language evolves. So now you have someone called in the thousand AD setting up the Holy Roman Empire, pretending to be Roman, pretending to be connected to the Greek philosophers, calling himself the Antichrist. This was a split. This is why the the Eastern Church did not follow along, but. It took 1,500 years of battles for the Roman Catholic Church to go in and to completely destroy, completely destroy the Eastern Church. And of course, they didn't tell me, "Oh, yes, we're going to go in and destroy our Christian brothers." What they say? They say we're going to go protect the Christian Church from the Muslims. But they wouldn't do that. What they were doing is they were they were putting their own priests in looking like the Eastern Christian churches and attacking the Muslims so the Muslims would think that the Eastern Christian church was attacking them as well. So they, 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 they would go in to these East, Eastern Catholic, Eastern Christian churches, the Muslims, and go in and start burning things to the ground with the people inside. This was the nature of the Holy Roman Empire. This was the nature of the Crusades, and they described the Crusades. Why do they have... Well, what? What do they say in history about the Crusades? Where do you see these books when, in some, some of these archives describing the monks of the uh, of of the uh, Holy Order, the, the Teutonic Knights? What would they have with them? They would have their mistresses, and they would have these parties upon which they would have these what we call orgies inside of a particular church. What was that? Why would they would particularly be having? sexual intercourse on the holy table. Well, if you go into your history of magic, you'll find that in the Black Mass, that's what a Black Mass is. The Black Mass is the sexual, sec, it's the sexual, ma it's a sex magic. And in this case, they were using uh, Black Magic. They were using the Black Masses all the way from the beginning. The church, the, the hidden part of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church, was pagan. It was Masonic. It was demonic. And what happens, you have, out of these situations, you have uh, the guilds, who were the artisans. Uh, you know, we started off in, you know at the bottom rung of society. You worked way, way up to a craftsman. You were invited into these particular guilds that would 
uh, give you uh, prestige and some degree of power you, over your fellow citizens, and this is how you rank society in classism. And what would, what would, how would these artisans be recognized in these guilds? Well, one of the guilds was no, were, were basically the ones who worked with stone, the stone workers guild. And what were they called? They were called the masons. The masons are a stone working guild. So why do we call them the, today the masons? Because the, the, the magicians, the, the, the black magic part of the church, the pagan part of the church, of the, of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, hid itself within these uh, particular guilds. They used the guilds as a cover for the black magic. And I'm not talking about just simply, uh, I'm not talking about uh, 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 what you hear in folklore. This is something darker and deeper. You'll have to go into Gnosis to understand this. Uh, this is the, the left-hand path of uh, the right-hand path, the left-hand path and right-hand path. But it gets very complex. It's not a very simple. No, it's not a simple thing. And the symbology is, does not mean what you think it means. There is a lot of errors within the symbology. But look what happens? They use these people who, who who don't have enough knowledge. In other words, they have all these different pieces of the puzzle, but they haven't put the puzzle together correctly. The puzzle has a lot of dimensions to it that aren't necessarily off obvious. It's not simply two dimensional. This is. <laughs> More than three dimensional. It has multiple dimensions. It depends on how you can connect one event to another. These are your different fragments, and so it, it does become very complex. But because what happens is, how would they how would they understand these fragments? How would you understand this coding? Because the coding wasn't deep there. Well, you'd use calculus. This is Newton and Leibniz. So the other thing is, is that with Newton and Leibniz. Everyone thinks, oh, yes, 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 that's the Renaissance, the European Enlightenment. The problem is this whole concept of using uh, predictive science, predictive mathematics, is going to be, it's been a complete lie. It's a LARP. It's, it, it's a live-action role, but it's a fiction. Because it began with uh, Fibonacci, moved over to da Vinci. He wasn't able to do anything necessarily with it. That doesn't necessarily mean they weren't codes, because... A lot of the stuff that we're working with couldn't be seen to be done by the Roman Catholic Church because they had a public face to save. Bring this forward to Newton and Leibniz. So this is the beginning of your sort of understanding of what the world is. Well, they're not going to tell you that they're working with that they were alchemists, so they hit the work. So calculus became this amazing mathematics; you could predict everything you wanted to predict. And this is why you have IPP. IPCC, and this is why you have the projections of COVID or CVD. It's all based in on Da Vinci. It's all based in uh, Fibonacci. And unless you understand these connections, particularly Da Vinci to, to Fibonacci, you're going to completely miss the whole the whole ride. And that's why today most people don't understand what what racism really is. It's a form of classism. Classism. The, the races were the ones who did not meet up to the cla to the proper class, and they were a, an undercurrent in society. They were part of the underclass. They had no formal existence. This is what race racism is. Racism are people who have no formal or fundamental existence. Now, is this a bad thing? Not necessarily. Life, and I know this from personal experience, is basically what you make out of it. This is how people, like my uncles, who were, I was talking about my, my background and, and where I come from. I'm a Kata, and the Kata are the people who were part of the, of the whole called, thing called the Armenian Genocide. We come from that, that, that sort of uh, east, uh, the, the uh, western portion of Turkey where the genocide took place. And it was more than just the Armenians, it was the Pondi, there was a whole group of of other people who were involved, and and this was this is was this was who my fam where my family came from, and you go back into the history and you find that these people came over with absolutely nothing, and, and, and even some of my uncles today who were who come over, uh, this is from uh, from the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, they came from these tiny little villages where they were they were sharecroppers, they they made their own medicines, they made their own clothing. There wasn't there wasn't a sense that oh I could own this and I could own that but yet they started from nothing 
as as child labor as they started. They were working at 11, 10, 11, 12, 10, 11, and 12 years old. They were at work. They weren't in school. Yet, yet these today, many of them are many of them became millionaires. It's like the like the movie Slumdog Millionaire. But you see that you see this ability to thrive, survive, and thrive, even though you're part of the underclass. And they never they never really change. They, they even though they are more more well to do, they fundamentally haven't changed. And this is what makes a bourgeois or the bougie. This is what they make. They are these are people who have been elevated in class but still maintain the ghetto attitude. This is if I want to use this in terms of a reflection. I said, and this is, why don't people see this? Because you have to look outside your own existence. You go look around and see who, who, who was involved in slavery. Who were the slaves? And you find that slavery was global. It was all what, what, what they did to the indigenous people in North America. They did to indigenous people around the world. This was the Western attitude of the thing. And the West was basically England, France, Germany. These were the white people. It's Western Europe. Not Eastern Europe, but Western Europe. And this is lost on everybody because most people only know the created reality. They know the created narrative. And this is what all Edward Bernays, this creation has been going on for a long time, but it hasn't succeeded. You had the Catholic New World Order. You had the Protestant New World Order. That failed. And then after that, you had the Humanist New World Order. That failed. And you had two, as a matter of fact, you had two humanists. You had the first, you had the Nazis come up and do thing, their own thing. Then you had the, so, the, the socialists, the, the communists. Because the nationalists and the socialists, nationalists and the communists are the same thing. Nationalists sit on the right, communists sit on the left. Uh, your, your, your nationalists were involved in genetics. Anytime you, you talk about genetics, you're talking about a nationalist. That's Hitler. Anytime you're talking about uh, psychology, that is Stalin, that is Lenin, that is Trotsky. There on the left, that's communism. This is how these things, in terms of the work definition, in terms of how they termed reality, this is what they are. All of them have failed. Spectacular. And you have, and in each case, you had millions of people dead. <clears throat> and I think it, was, it wasn't because of one particular person. I mean, Hitler didn't do all the work himself. He had the, he had his bureaucracy. But every everyone in the bureaucracy, well, I've got my job. I got my kids. I, 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 I can't afford to lose my boat, my house, my this or that. They had things personally that they were invested in that allowed them to say, well, at least as long as I'm not doing the killing, if someone gets killed because of what I need, no problem. This is what it was. This is the way it was. And so we, we all, and this is what happens with, with, with the vaccines today. When they, when they talk about, they're actually talking about internment camps, which will become concentration camps, because they believe they're doing the right thing. They've been sold. Your vax, your vax, as who are basically liberals and, 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 and uh, your Democrats, your and in Canada the liberals, they took the name of the actual uh, uh, persuasion, if you will. Uh, these are the people who believe they have the right to tell everybody else how to live and what to do, and if you do not agree with them, you are the enemy, you are dangerous, and they have the right to kill you in order to protect everybody else. And this is what the whole vaxxer thing is about. Getting rid of the people who are unvaxxed because they believe there is a danger. There's no research there. It's all coming out of CNN, uh, Newsweek, and this is what you see on Twitter. They're, never quote, they're not quoting research journals. Matter of fact, they're going into research lists, which has a public appearance. They're talking to researchers and pointing out stuff from Newsweek and CNN in terms of the actual data. <laughs> When you have a person like that, you can't talk to them. There's no, there's no discussion there because they don't want to see. They don't want to listen. They think they are the best thing. I mean, the one I saw yesterday that was sort of kind of floored me and sort of got me sort of going a little bit was this doctor so and so. I'm not. I can't remember the name. Because it wasn't necessarily important, but he was a he was attacking the data put forward by a researcher based on this research. This was a virologist 
put into the, and he had an MD putting together the list of of the data of what he see was going what, what, uh, what he see what he saw going on clinically. This other this other doctor who was basically on I, I go check the background. What is the profile? It's either nothing. It's a dead profile, which tells you that the troll paid troll, or it's got a background. They they are a philosopher and economist. And who was he quoting as as his source? CNN and Newsweek. This is who the vaxxers are. This is who the liberals are. This is who the Democrats are. I'm sorry if you're offended by this, but think this is what's going on. It's not by it's not by my saying this. This is the observation. And if you don't like it, what you have to do is you have to get up and change yourself. Disassociate, disassociate yourself with these people. Say, hey, that's not. I'm sorry. I was a Democrat. I was a liberal. That's what that's what Lionel's done. I was a Democrat. I was a liberal. Not anymore. I'm sorry. I just don't agree with that field. And you have to get up and separate yourself if you are part of a particular group. I'm not a part of a particular group, so I do occasionally come up and say, "Okay, I'm anti-establishment." I have to remind people, I'm not part of the establishment. I never have been part of the establishment. My vote is always based on a person who is going to be around me the least. Who's going to produce the least amount of government? And that's typically your Republican or your conservative. Because they will talk about things, but they're going to end up, at the end of the day, no matter what they do, they're going to underfund things, they're going to cut funding, and lock themselves in their uh, country clubs, which I don't care about anyways. Uh, and uh, good for them. Keep, keep, keep yourself away from me. I don't want to be part of any of that, and they don't mind because they don't want me there anyways. So, anyways, uh, I think that's going to be it for now, and we're going to go on to the No Season Vlog next, and we'll see you uh, uh, probably sometime later on in the evening. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life. <laughs>